Hillary, can you hear me? Or Haley, can you hear me? Yep, I can. I had a little. All right, and are we just are we as chat good to go? I believe so. I was just about to send out a thing. Let us know where you're from and what generation you belong to. Elizabeth, are you able to see my chats? I can see you. Okay. I okay. haven't seen anybody else. So is everyone able to use chat? If you're not, use the Q&A. But if you can, let us know where you're from and what generation you belong to. Oh, there we go. Hey, Rebecca. We're just waiting for Jean to join us. There she is. Hello. Hey, Jean, can you hear me? I can. We're so excited about this talk tonight. I'm, I've got so many questions for you. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. And normally we have our um, one of our co-owners, Allison, joining, but she is a bit under the weather. So we are, um, you've just got, you're stuck with me tonight. <laughs> no worries. But I, um, I will say I, I read in, in chunks of three months with publications. And um, when I saw this book was coming out, I could not wait till I could start reading these spring books. This was the first book I wanted to, to read because I just sort of have a little mini obs or obsession with um, generational characteristics. I think it's so fascinating. So this was just so much fun to read. Glad you liked it. So you're, are you, you're in San Diego? Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Very good. Well, we'll get started here in about a minute. Everyone's letting us know where they're from and uh, what generation they belong to. Perfect. I was actually uh, just in Waco in January, giving a talk at the law school at Baylor. Yes, I am. Um, I had just heard that. In fact, my husband went to Baylor Law School um, and I was talking to a, a group of women about this book and they said, oh yes, Jean, Jean came to, to uh, speak to us. So, oh. and let me, is it twangy? Is that correct? It's twangy, like twangy guitar. Twangy guitar, twangy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I thought it was twinge. That's what it looks like to me. And then I, I thought, well, that someone who was at that talk said, that's not right. So I started deep diving and almost every video, either people call you Jean or they start without saying your name. Right. So probably on purpose. Yeah. That's so I wanted to get that straight before we get going. So yeah, I'm okay. sorry. My light's a little bit weird. It's just a, the, the window I'm in front of faces West. Oh yeah. No worries. Okay. I, just, we're just so excited to pick your brain tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Elizabeth Barnhill. I'm the book buyer at Fabled Bookshop here in Waco. And Generations is uh, when I found out that you were going to be our speaker, or I said yes, I nearly did a happy dance. I've been so excited about this for months um, because this is such a fascinating topic. And I think it's something that we can all learn a lot about our peers and what makes us tick. And also, how to be a, a good mentor, how to be a, a good boss, how to be a good mom or dad. Um, so I'm thrilled to talk to you tonight. So I'm going to um, introduce you. We not, tonight have Jean Twangy. Did I, did I? You got it. Okay. Yes. PhD, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. She's the author of more than a hundred scientific publications and several books based on her research, including Generations, iGen, and Generation Me. Her research has been covered in Time, The Atlantic, Newsweek, 
The New York Times, USA Today, and The Washington Post. She has also been featured on The Today Show, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, CBS Sun uh, This Morning, and NPR. She lives in San Diego with her husband and three daughters. We are so excited to talk to you tonight. Great to be here. Um, and I will say, I so are you a member of Gen X? Is that correct? Yes. I'm a Gen Xer, and I have my parents are baby boomers, and my children are Gen Z. So mm -hmm. and it was, and it made me a little bit sad reading this, thinking I guess the the greatest generation is not really on our our list anymore of influences. But those those were my grandparents. Mm -hmm. But how did you get into this line of research? So I was working on my honors thesis as a senior in college and, and using a questionnaire that had a lot of items about personality traits that are sometimes considered stereotypically masculine or stereotypically feminine. So that things like lead, being a leader or being assertive is on that masculine scale. And I gave that questionnaire to a bunch of my fellow students and noticed that they were scoring very different from what the 1970s test manual said they should score like. And then I realized that actually made a lot of sense because there had been a lot of change over that 20 year period, particularly for women, and that that might be a generational difference. And so that just kind of started you in the deep dive of the, all the different generations. Yeah, I mean, it was around, you know, early 1990s. So this was around the time that the media was kind of trying to figure out um, what to call the young generation. Um, and that was eventually Gen X, because they realized really they weren't boomers anymore. So what was going on? Um, and so there were a lot of articles and a lot of books written about Gen X at that time. They're really interesting. I devoured them all. But I also noticed that a lot of them weren't based on much actual data. Maybe they have some demographics, but they would say things like, oh, Gen Xers have low self-esteem. I'd be like, wait, you know, that's something that I'm studying since this point I was in grad school. And did they actually collect any survey data on that? And usually the answer was no. So I realized that was a big opportunity to do research in an area that was interesting, but there actually hadn't been that much done. Well, sounds like you got into a great uh, research there. Um, I... I would like for you, if, if you can, uh, let's talk about the, the five generations. We're not going to really talk about the polars as much, which are the babies being born right now. Right. Uh, but the five generations, can you tell me maybe one interesting characteristic of each one? I know it's probably hard to narrow it down. And maybe um, something that surprised you and also maybe something that um, each generation, is, there's a big misconception with the generation. Mm -hmm. I can, for, for some of those, it might be the th all, all three in the same one. Okay. Um, so I start with the silent generation, those born 1925 to 1945. So they were the leaders of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. It's often thought that that was boomers, but it was, it was silent. Uh, so two of their famous members, Martin Luther King Jr., Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Then the boomers, born 1946 to 1964. So there's a common perception that boomers are all rich and powerful, and they succeeded and then changed the rules and pulled the ladder up behind them so then the millennials couldn't climb it. This is a very, very common narrative, especially mm -hmm. if you spend any time online. And, you know, that's really not true. I mean, certainly there's been some boomers who have been successful, but those who didn't go to college ended up in a really difficult position because when they were graduating from high school, it was still possible to do pretty well, well, say with a factory job. And then those jobs went away. And mm -hmm. for a lot of those boomers, it was a little too late to, to start over. So there's a, some you know, big issues, especially for boomers without a college education who are in middle to older ages now with um, a lot of drugs, a lot of what economists call deaths of despair. And you know, overall, boomers were really the first victims of the changes in the economy and of income equality, not the perpetrators. They were actually not the ones who made those rules, but they felt the consequences. So Gen X, um, born 1965 to 1979. So uh, Gen X is the middle child of generations, both literally in terms of where they sit right now, but also figuratively in that everybody forgets about us on a regular basis, which, you know, I think a lot of Gen Xers actually like, we kind of like flying under the radar. So Gen X um, was the last generation to have an analog childhood and the first to have an internet adulthood. So millennials born 1980 to 1994, 
Um, common perception there is that uh, millennials uh, have not done well economically, and that was true during the Great Recession. But since the Great Recession, their both their income and their wealth has really roared back. So this was the excerpt of the of the book that was um, in the Atlantic a couple weeks ago. Because um, if you look at median incomes for 25 to 44 year olds, they're at all time highs, and that is corrected for inflation. And then for wealth, which takes student debt into account, for example, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis has been researching generational wealth. And in their most recent data, millennials are neck and neck with Gen X and on track to catch up with boomers. Um, so then we have Gen Z. So those born 1995 to 2012. Um, so that's my kids It's um, who are teenagers, and then I have an 11 year old old as well. Uh, and they're also young adults. So managers who had the idea that their young employees were millennials, not anymore. The oldest <laughs> of Gen Z is 28. So whether you're in business or even if you're working, say, in medicine or law, your new employees are probably Gen Z, not millennials. So mm -hmm. for Gen Z, what really distinguishes them is a really profound shift Millennials as young people were very optimistic and confident, and Gen Z is not. Gen Z is much more pessimistic and is suffering from depression at much higher rates than previous generations did at the same age. Something, I mean, I I, I highlighted this book all, all over the place, um, but one thing I kind of was curious uh, your take on this, it seems like there, there is pendulum swings just in life in general. Do you, do you feel like there's like every other generation uh, has some characteristics that are similar? Like I know you said like the baby boomers and uh, millennials are more political than say the Gen X um, and maybe even Gen X. I know as, as young people were a little more pessimistic, mm -hmm. a little more depressed, and then they wound up being happier, which is the opposite of millennials. Mm -hmm. But if Gen Z is sort of that right now, you wonder if they're going to be more optimistic later on. So do, do you see that at all? Maybe some characteristics every other generation? There's a little bit of that. I think the, the political one doesn't really completely fit because Gen Z would be the one who I would peg as being as political as boomers were when they were young in terms of their rates of voting and political participation. Uh, but optimism versus pessimism, that has a little bit of validity. Uh, boomers and millennials being more optimistic when they were young and Gen Xers and Gen Z being more pessimistic. But for the most part, what's really shaped the generations are things that are more linear. So things like technology. So technological change, not just smartphones and social media and the internet, but things like labor saving devices and better medical care. Mm -hmm. And that progress of technology tends to be pretty linear. And that's what's really had the biggest impact on day to day life. Yeah, I found that to be fascinating that that's really that's sort of how you can define each generation is the technology that that came about when they were young. Can you talk about that a little bit with each generation with technology? Uh, kind of spurred them on? Yeah. Um, it's easiest to start with the boomers with that because for the boomers, it, it was television. And I think television explains a lot about boomers' individualism and more focus on the self and less on others. I think it also you know, kind of hand in hand with that, that explains a lot about the boomers' emphasis on uh, transparency and sharing and self-expression because TV as a medium lends itself to that. Mm -hmm. And boomers grew up with that. And with Gen X, there's there's the build still of that individualism being fairly linear. Um, but I think for, for Gen X, what distinguishes them is actually something that may not have been anticipated at the time, that Gen X was the, the last whole generation to have a unified pop culture experience. Mm -hmm. So some older millennials had that too. But you know, with Gen X, there were the three channels when they were kids. And so there are the Saturday morning cartoons and certain movies, and almost everybody would have these experiences. And then you ended up with cable and then the internet and YouTube and TikTok and things became much more atomized. And although there's still some things that people have as a common experience when they're young with pop culture, it's not the same. And I think that's 
why a lot of Gen Xers love their pop culture, love telling their kids about their pop culture because it's such a unified experience. Uh, and then with millennials, it was the early days of the internet and social media when it was a way to connect with people, when it was positive. Then with Gen Z, all those things turned more negative because they started to replace face-to-face -face social interaction. Because it's not just that Gen Z teens and young adults spend more time online. Right around the time social media became really popular, around 2012 or so, that's also when they started spending a lot less time just hanging out with their friends in person. So the online interaction replaced teens hanging out with their friends face-to-face. Well, and yeah, I'd like to ask you about that. So, I mean, technology is, I guess, a double-edged sword. And, you know, I want to ask, it, it seems like it's bad because the more technology that's in our lives, these younger generations seem like they're uh, more depressed to have more issues with that. Would you agree with that? Or, I mean, this seems like the silence are the happiest generation mm -hmm. and then Gen Z maybe is the, the least happy and the biggest difference is their access to technology. So can you speak about that? Yeah, so technology is often a trade-off. And, you know, I don't, you know, technology writ large, uh, I think is a net good. Because think about what life was like, say, 150 years ago, when we didn't have modern medicine. You know, life expectancy was, what, 60, if that. Um, and if you wanted to do laundry, it would take all day, you know, and you'd have to boil water an iron pot over an open fire and use, you know, rough soap that would rub off your skin. Um, and now what do we do? We just put clothes in the washing machine and then go relax. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a completely different way of life. You know, you're not as focused on survival. Um, and I think it's really been since we've had technologies that have replaced human in interaction. That's mm -hmm. where we've ended up with problems. So TV did that to an extent, but smartphones and social media did it much more because that was a technology you could take out of the house with you. So even when you were out of the house with people, it can interfere with that interaction. <clears throat> it can replace those face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and although TV certainly, you know, tries to keep people watching, it's not the same as the way the social media companies have poured millions, if not billions, into their algorithms that keep people on the apps. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I think about the trade-offs of technology, I think about it this way, that technology has given us more years of life, has given us more hours in the day because we don't have to focus on survival and things like doing laundry and going and hunting our food. Um, but Technology has also filled up those hours and maybe even filled up those years, often with things that are not particularly good for us, you know, like endless hours of watching videos. Right. Yeah, I think the the initial thought was going to be that we were going to be so much smarter and it's mm -hmm. really just no more information, but we're not any wiser for it. So. Yeah. Um, all right. In the book, you talk a lot about the idea of generations with that are ind individualism versus collectivism. So uh, can you talk about that to our, our listeners? Yeah. So technology makes individualism possible. That it allows people to be more independent, say, live on their own. It also allows people to have more time to focus on the self and to focus on uh, things like feeling good about the self. So individualism, it takes different forms. Um, it has advantages and disadvantages. So one of its big advantages as a cultural system is more freedom and more equality for people regardless of background. But it can also lead to conflict. It can also lead to disconnection because if everybody is thinking of, of themselves in terms of an individual, as an individual rather than a member of a collective society, you can see how that could potentially lead to problems sometimes. Yeah. And then um, another thing you talk quite a bit about in the book is this idea of a slow life theory. Can you explain that to us? I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah, this really explains a lot about the generational change. And I, I think, you know, my goal in the book is for, to help people understand each other. And I think understanding the slow life strategy is really helpful for understanding why, say, your life is different from your parents or grandparents or your kids or grandkids. So 
at times and places when people live longer and when education takes longer to finish, parents tend to make the choice to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. So the entire trajectory slows down. The entire life trajectory slows down from infancy to old age. So kids are less independent. Teens are less likely to get their driver's license or have a paid job or go out on dates. Young adults um, get married later, have kids later, settle into careers later. And then in middle to older age, people feel and look younger than their parents or grandparents did at the same age. So it's the idea of 60 is the new 50. It's just across the board, we take longer because life expectancy is longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, is it normal for every generation to criticize or be confused by the generation that follows? Um, and why do we compare ourselves so much to each generation? So I think it is. Um, there, there is a natural tendency, and but often I think that's based on misunderstandings. Uh, so that's one reason, you know, I really like digging into this topic and trying to find the real differences among the generations as opposed to stereotypes or observations. Because that way, if you draw from, as I did, like all of this survey data, then you're asking people about themselves and their own experiences rather than having to rely on, say, older people's perceptions of what they think the younger generation is like and how they think that they're different. Yeah, I, um, I, after I read this book, I think I talked about it every single day to every person I work with at the bookstore. Of course, most of them are Gen Z and they're, they're about my children's age. So it, it was so interesting. I, you know, one of the things that you talked about with the Gen Z is that they, they feel like our founding fathers were villains. More of them feel that way than yeah, the 40% do compared to 10% of boomers. That was one of those results that really, you know, set me back in my chair. I, it was really stunning. Yeah. In fact, that was the thing I asked all of them. I said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Mm -hmm. yeah. do, what do you feel about our founding father? Yeah. It's just, yeah. it was an interesting conversation. And yeah. I will, one of the things, let me, let me pull up my book here that I found so fascinating. Um, and I've, I've written down what I kind of took it like the generation X let's we're more independent, more individualistic, more um, proud of, of being a little more resilient, I guess. Mm -hmm. And millennials wanted to feel special. That was more of their, their, it seems like just a little mm -hmm. generalizing. And then Gen Z likes, likes to feel like a victim. There's a lot of them who have more of a victim mentality. And one, one passage that just shocked me is um, perceived, this is the Gen, Gen Z, perceived versus actual gender discrimination, getting a college education mm -hmm. is um, easy to quantify. The number of teen girls who believed that women were discriminated against in getting a college education doubled between 2012 and 2019. Yet in 2019, the majority, 60% of college degrees went to women. So it, and you have a graph, there's a lot of graphs here, but it shows mm -hmm. women getting a college education mm -hmm. and then women perceiving just that they're being discriminated against and all this, you know, this mm -hmm. right here happened. So mm -hmm. and I really like how, I mean, you don't play sides. You're like, there's a reason, surely there's a reason that they have this victim mentality. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what do you, what do you say about that? What do you, what did you find with that research? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And cause it, you know, we have to put this in context and I say this in the book that gender discrimination does still exist, not as much as we once had, thank goodness, but it does still exist. I'm not at all denying that, but when it comes to getting a college education, that's place, a place where we not only have equality, but women are actually doing better. So that makes me think that, you know, that perception of the high school seniors there of more gender discrimination in that area, in getting college education, seems to be more perception than reality. And given that, you have to ask, well, then why? You know, why is that? Is there that perception? And um, that's a hard, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think it has something to do with something I came back to kind of over and over in the in the book and thinking about our current cultural moment is the negativity online and on social media, at least on some sites, um, and just kind of in our national discussion so often 
is there there is this emphasis on the negative there's an emphasis on seeing discrimination and then this isn't you know my original idea but some people have said you know there's an emphasis on um on being a victim and that there's um strength in being a victim almost mm -hmm. that that's something that people almost take pride in which is different i mean mm -hmm. whether you think that's good or bad that's definitely different from um, attitudes 20 years ago or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when, when I've talked to a lot of people I know, of course, my peer group are Gen X. Um, and I said, I was talking to you, they were so excited because this generation, Gen X, is having somewhat of a hard time relating to Gen Z or even some millennials. Um, and again, it's the sticks and stones will break my bones generation mm. versus words or violence, maybe a little mm -hmm. less um, resilient. And, you know, how how can we work well together? Um, and another passage, I I don't typically read passages, but I, this has just been so fascinating to me. Um, so this is a Gen X journalist speaking here. Mm -hmm. uh, when she was young, Dom said she looked up to older writers because she had things in common with older generations, books, pay phones, face-to-face -face communication. The same cannot be said for the relationship between my generation and those who have come behind us. Young people don't want us, uh, young people don't want to be us because they're not even the same species as us. The world has changed so much between my time and theirs that some when 10 years younger even, might as well belong to a, a different geological epoch. In this epoch, there are no pay phones for calling friends at the spur of the moment. The contact highs from walking down the street have been replaced by a dopamine hit from an Instagram like. To a young person, someone like me is not so much an elder as an extinction. My generation will be the last to have known the world in its analog form. As a result, we've grown old before actually getting old. We've become dinosaurs before we're even 50. Wow. So how do we relate to our children and even our coworkers who are, uh, who've come after us? Yeah. And I have to give a shout out that that is Megan Dom's book, uh, The Problem With Everything, which I just devoured. Um, and I got to be on her podcast a couple of weeks ago. We're about the same age and obviously, you know, I had a lot to talk about because um, her, her book would really kind of help me put into perspective some of those generation gaps, particularly between uh, Gen X, you know, and millennials and, and Gen Z, um, that Gen X took, took pride in toughness that um, there is that that digital divide that it you know it's just hard to relate across that and I think to an extent generations have experienced that I think you know when boomers were the ones in their 50s um, I know there were a lot of Gen Xers who were like well you don't understand but again it was based on a lot of these technological developments and I think what she's capturing there is that you know a lot of especially gen z you know grew up with social media grew up with smartphones and just to, it, take it completely for granted that is of course the only world that they've ever known and they don't see any relevance whatsoever to a lot of the things gen x takes pride in um mm -hmm. toughness just being one example um you know a lot of the kind of outdated skills of how to use a card catalog i get why they don't think that's important because it's not anymore. <laughs> but in terms of attitudes and values, I think that's where there's a more fundamental generation gap. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I have to tell a funny story. Um, we were talking at work one day um, and one of the books that was coming out was by one of the, the lead singers of the Bengals. So one of our millennial workers said, he were the Bengals. And, and my other Gen, Gen X uh, employee and I said, don't you know, walk like an Egyptian? And she said, oh, that's, that's, tr that's troublesome. <laughs> that's just such a, like, it's, it's such a part of our culture, but I guess the, the next generation is like, wow, that we probably don't need to sing a song called walk like an Egyptian. That probably is triggering to somebody. Um, okay. And, and it's, it was, I loved reading about every generation, but Gen Z was a little scary reading that section about our children. Um, so, you know, 
are our children going to be okay? Because it is, it was a frightening uh, section to read. Yeah. And the, these are, these are big problems um, that we, we can't underestimate. So um, this was also something I wrote a lot about in my, my last book called iGen, which was about Gen Z, but we have a lot more data now, almost six years later. And, but I'll start this story, you know, at that point when I was doing the research for, for that book that, um, you know, I work with these big surveys often of teens and in the data around 2012 started to notice some big shifts that more and more teens started to say they felt lonely and left out more started to say they felt like they couldn't do anything right or that they didn't enjoy life. And those last two are classic symptoms of depression. Then it just, it was like the floodgates open and across the board, more and more evidence started to pile up. Clinical level depression started to go up around then. Emergency room admission, sorry, emergency room admissions for self-harm started to go up. Um, ER admissions for suicide attempts, completed suicides, just pretty much every indicator of mental health for teens and eventually young adults too, started to go in the wrong direction. So that of course begs the question of why. And um, you know, for that previous book, I, I puzzled over this for a really, really long time because there was no obvious explanation at first. It was not the economy. The US economy finally started to improve around 2012 and you know, kept going on a pretty consistent tear until about 2020 when it had a few wobbles with the pandemic. So it wasn't that. Uh, it was hard to think of any event that happened around 2012 that kind of reverberated throughout the decade. And then one day I realized, well, 2012, I saw in a poll, happened to be the first year the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. Mm. And in the same survey data of teens too, is also around the time social media use moved from something about half of teens were doing every day. So it was optional something almost all of them were doing every day. So it became almost mandatory. And I think that's not a coincidence that mm -hmm. the popularity, the rise of smartphones and social media happened at exactly the same time that teen depression started to go up. And it's not just that it happened at the same time. It's also that that was by far the biggest change in teens' day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. That's what had the biggest impact on how they lived their lives, how they spent time with friends, because that coincided with them spending less time with each other face to face, also coincided with them spending less time sleeping. Mm -hmm. So less time with friends face to face, less time sleeping, more time on a screen is not a good formula for mental health. Mm -hmm. Wow. I wonder if, I mean, do you think there's hope? Have you heard, you know, do you feel like that pendulum is going to swing at all um, positively or do you, it, does it seem like maybe the, the usage of cell phone is going to go down because children are realizing how dangerous it is. Maybe not. I don't know. I think we need a lot more regulation. I mean, right now, social media is extremely unregulated. Mm -hmm. You are supposed to be 13 to be able to get an account. Even that is not enforced. Mm -hmm. you know, no age verification is taken. You just check a box. Um, and parental permission isn't necessary. 13 is also a terrible age to introduce social media. I mean, we really need to get social media out of middle schools. So I and, and many others are starting to advocate for more regulation of social media, particularly around children, say to raise the minimum age to 16 and to mm -hmm. require parental permission and to actually verify age and not just guess. Wow. Yeah, it, it is kind of a scary like that. I guess millennials and even Gen Z were the wild west of this. I mean, I, I even know I mean, my children were born 1999 to 2004 and the, how they handle social media is even so much different than my nieces and nephews who were 10 years younger. Um, so it, it is a scary wild west thing. We don't know what the impact is going to be. Yeah. Kids. And I mean, well, I think, unfortunately, I think we do and it hasn't been good. It's, yeah. it's been a teen mental health epidemic. And, you know, and I think it's important to emphasize too that there has been a lot of focus on mental health among adolescents recently, but so often it's attributed to the pandemic and it's not due to the pandemic. It started more than 10 years ago. Yeah, I did have a question about the pandemic. I mean, do you, do you feel like it hit any generation harder than another generation? It, it seems like it's pushed the baby boomers out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a lot of ways, 
I, I enjoyed the pandemic because my children came home from college <laughs> uh, and I didn't have to deal with teaching my you know children at home mm-hmm. um, like some of the you know people who have little children. So, I mean, do you feel like it probably hit the children the hardest or what do you think? I think that's probably going to be the, the most concerning long-term impact. I mean, long COVID and people who are suffering from that, obviously that's going to be a huge impact. But I think the kids who have learning deficits now, and that's going to be both polars and maybe the younger part of, of Gen Z, mm-hmm. uh, that, that may be, end up being the, the biggest long-term effect. Because mm-hmm. in terms of mental health, the trends got just, they kept going in the same direction. They didn't actually get worse during the pandemic. And there's some indicators that there were actually some things that kind of leveled off. It actually was not as bad as you might think in terms of, of, of mental health. But the learning deficits, that that may have a longer term impact. Yeah, and even a, 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 the prosperity versus uh, poverty, I'm sure the children who were in lower economic status where their parents had to work are going to suffer even more. But I have thought, um, you know, when when we Gen Xers are elderly and having doctor <laughs> needing care from physicians, those are the physicians who've missed a whole lot of school. <laughs> So I hope we're going to be okay as Gen Xers, as elderly. Um, all right, I have a question about micro generations. And it seems like a lot of times I'll ask someone, what is your generation? And they'll say, I'm an elder millennial mm-hmm. or an exennial. And it seems like millennials do that maybe more than other generations. I don't know. Is that is that something that you've seen? And, and how do you really come up with the, the dates for the cutoff? Yeah. So some of the cutoffs are pretty straightforward, like the baby boom is defined by demographics. The cutoff between Gen Xers and millennials could go either way in maybe even five years, another direction. Um, The cutoff between millennials and Gen Z, I'm more confident of because there were such sudden changes in um, things like loneliness and depression and Mm self-esteem. And then um, Gen Z versus polar. So I cut that off 2012 versus 2013. I think that makes some sense because of um, the age kids were during the pandemic Mm -hmm. that I think Gen Z will have memories of a time before COVID and most pollers will not. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it also is, I mean, it's a little, this is a little less precise, but I think it also is a, is a good cough because if you think about the ages of kids being you know, seven versus eight, you know, during that time, I mean, think about being a kindergartner during the pandemic or kids, you know, but if they're like fourth or fifth grade, it wasn't quite as bad, you know, they're a little easier to sit still and be able to do a few more things on their own and and things like that. So I think there's, you can, you can come up with some defenses for those, but, but there are, there are micro generations, you know, knowing someone's exact birth year is absolutely going to tell you more than just knowing their generation. Um, That's one reason that most of the graphs in in the book are line graphs. They show all of the change across all of the years. You know, I still have some bar graphs where I've grouped the generations just depends on, on, uh, you know, the best way to understand it. But it is a good idea when you can to look across the years, because there's, there are differences between of course, between say a millennial born in 1980 and one born in 1994, they had different experiences. That's true. Yeah. Well, does anyone have any questions for Jean while we have her here? Everyone's been kind of quiet. I see Marie is asking um, who were considered the builder generation. I don't, I've never heard of the builder generation. I haven't either, although it, it could be an alternative name either for the silence or the greatest generation born 1901 to 1924. Okay. And tell me again why they're called the silent generation. So they got that name from a Time Magazine article in the, I think it was the late 1940s when, you know, they just weren't making a lot of noise and they were marrying young and they had their kids young. So the label fits in in that way. But given that they led the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, I think it's a real misnomer for the most part. Yeah, I, I enjoyed reading about that. And of course, I have some uncles and aunts who were war babies. I guess they call that's the the end of the silent generation. Yeah. Um, I was very surprised. That was something I was really surprised learning because you always think of the baby boomers as the ones who were, you know, mm-hmm. social change. But um, and I also liked learning that the 
the baby boomers are more of a chameleon group um, that they were the hippies at one point, then they became the yuppies That's and right. then, then they became more of the uh, environmental crunchy conservatives. And um, I thought that was, that was really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, they're, it's partially because they're a big generation, you know, they have, there's lots of variation within the generation, but it's also, you know, they just, they push the culture in the direction that they wanted it to go. So how has it been since the, the book has launched? What have, what have you been doing to promote it? Well, who have you, what have you done? Yeah. Since- a lot of podcasts. Mm-hmm. So a lot of, you know, long conversations. Um, the, you know, the excerpt in the Atlantic was on um, the stuff about millennials doing well economically. So a lot of discussion about that. I did a few follow-up radio interviews, you know, based on that. Um, Michael Smirkanish had me on CNN. So he's had me on a number of times before for my previous book. And um, he, like a a lot of people is very concerned about adolescent mental health and how that can be linked to social media use. So that's usually what we discuss when I'm on his show. Yeah. Now, Amanda has a question and I was, this is a, a good question. Uh, what would you tell Gen X bosses in order to help them bridge the gap of understanding and success with Gen Z employees? Yeah. You know, the, the first step is, is, trying to take their perspective and that's hard and but just realizing that they grew up in in a very different time with very different technology and very different experiences that you know is just one example that because of the slow life strategy for a lot of gen z going out with their friends and getting that driver's license was just not that central of an experience Mm -hmm. and that they're also getting married later and having kids later and just that development just takes longer. And I think it's it's really easy to look at that and say, um, oh, but you know, that means they're less mature and to be judgmental about it. But you always have to kind of take a step back from that and realize, you know, there's good things about this. I mean, parents are thrilled that not as many teens are having sex and drinking alcohol. Most of us think that's pretty, pretty much a good thing. But then we also worry about our kids going off to college or going into the workplace and just not having as much experience with independence and decision making. So like that's that's one P. I always start when I get talks on generations in the workplace, I always start with that trend because there's a lot of things there people are surprised by. Um, I think it also gives that perspective of like, it's not bad or good, it just is. And here's something that's really different between the generations and just, you know, have the perspective that some advantages to Gen Z having grown up that way, but some disadvantages too. So they may not be as capable of being able to say, here, tell them here, go do this task and for them to be able to do that independently. Yeah. Maybe you were able to do that at 22, but they may, may not be able to do that. They may need more careful instructions. That's so interesting. And I think just always talking, communicating on both sides. There's a lot yes. that they can learn from us as well. That he grew up with corded, <laughs> corded phones. We, right. uh, and um what are some other either books or podcasts that you would recommend if we want to deep dive further into this? Of course, all of your books, which we sell at Fabled. Um, but what are some other ones that you would recommend? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I mentioned Megan Dom's The Problem with Everything. Uh, it's a memoir, but it's also really about our current culture and online discussions and just kind of how we got this way. And I, I, I just loved it. I couldn't put it down. And then um, one of the best nonfiction books that I have read in a really long time is What's Our Problem by Tim Urban. And oh. um, and I'm they, he didn't, it's only digital. So I'm sorry, this isn't gonna be something you're gonna be able to sell because he actually did, he, he doesn't even have paper copies. Um, but he's known for this blog um, called Wait But Why. But this book is such an amazing analysis of our current political climate and cultural climate um, as just one little um, sample. He talks about how it's not just that there's more people on the extreme right and the extreme left. He calls it that there are more people on the lower left and the lower right where the discussions quickly become not civil and Mm -hmm. not really about say exchanging ideas. I mean, just that rubric that he has for kind of understanding things is, is, is really amazing. Um, and, and he's got all these very, very funny line drawings in the book too. So 
I recommend that one a lot. Um, and I don't know if you have this one in your store, but there's um, a couple of fiction books that I really like from a perspective of, of change over time. So one's about the about the past. It's it's called Nine Ladies, and it's a Pride and Prejudice fan fiction. Kind of okay. it's, it's it's like it's Pride and Prejudice meets Outlander. Okay, I'm writing all these down. Yeah, um, and the Outlander books are amazing too. I mean, they're just they're these epic novels. Oh yes. Uh, of Good romance mind. and war and and history and it has those have perspective you know and over time too so then you know and I and I love Pride and Prejudice and I love Jane Austen and then reading this you know Pride and Prejudice fan fiction and immediately I could see it was a mashup of that and Outlander um, and the plot was just really really awesome I don't want to give it away uh, but it had a very interesting perspective on cultural change over the course of 200 years um, and then um, you might have to help me out with it with the, the next one. This one is more about about the future. Um, I think it was called Project Hail Mary. So yes. it was the same guy who wrote The Martian. Yes. I love that book so much when I finished it, I started again at the beginning. Yes, I love the extra character in that one. So you don't want I don't want to say Yeah, we don't we don't want to give it away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah but that, that's a great that's a great book. Something Grace. His last name was Grace. The the um not the author, but the main character. But that's a great one. Mm -hmm. um, Andy Weir wrote that. That's right. Yep. Um, another question here. What dangers arise from expecting someone to think and act according to their generation? Or is there a danger in that? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, we, we always have to realize anytime we're talking about differences among groups, whether that's race or gender or region, you have to make sure not to necessarily assume someone's going to be a typical member of their generation. I, obviously, given what I do, I do think there's a big strength in it and, and in knowledge in um, understanding what the average differences are and what experiences people might have had. Um, but you don't you don't want to always go straight to that at every moment in you know, when you're relating to someone. Um, but sometimes Times you you know get to know someone and they and they may have certain traits where you, you knowing their generation can help you understand a little more about that trait and a little bit more about where they're coming from and maybe even promote empathy you know I think um, I know that the whole cancel culture it seems like I think I read in the book where it's mostly the millennials and Gen Z who are coming at the Gen X groups mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we probably say things that we shouldn't say mm -hmm. just because that's how we were but it's not out of a malicious intent it was just how we were raised and if there is a little more understanding and empathy on all sides we would all do better so yep. absolutely well this was fascinating i've just been so excited to talk to you for a very long time and um i think people are tired of me talking about this book sorry no no offense but i talk <laughs> all the time um and i want to point out i think that haley's going to put in the chat we do have a um online book club through discord so if there's things that that you have thought about that you'd like to talk to it's it's in this little um here you can just click on on the links there but with discord you can talk about things we've talked about tonight or things that maybe that um gene that you've kind of sparked their interest in so i would love for you to participate in our online book club and if you don't mind just for a second we're going to talk about our book club for june and it's going to be a little different this this time around we're doing a summer series and we are going to have two authors come to fabled in person and we're so excited so the first one is june the 11th tj newman is coming in to discuss drowning which is one of my favorite books of the year it was fantastic um, and she'll be in the store and she's making a special trip here because fabled has been has promoted her book so well we're excited about that. And on June 20th, uh, my other favorite nonfiction of the year besides Generations, I will be talking to Laura Tremaine about the Life Council, and that will be in person. And we're also going to film it. So if you are far away, um, we will have a way for you to listen in on the Life Council, which is different ways that we uh, connect through friendship. So very excited about all that. And Jean, we just are so thankful that you joined us tonight um, and look, hope, hope, uh, good well wishes for your, um, for the book and hope to talk to you again sometime. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Good night. Hey, good night.